Geist sees you taken on the part of John Ramey, a chemical specialist who's tasked with infiltrating the rather sus corporation known as Vox. Of course, something goes terribly wrong, resulting in your soul being removed from your body, and you're left to roam Vox headquarters as a poltergeist. The ultimate goal of the game is to find your body, with the narrative taking some surprisingly dark turns before the curtains close. When it comes to gameplay, it might be better to divide this segment into two parts. You've got your first person gunplay, which is if I'm being honest, the more disappointing part of the game, mixed with a possession mechanic, with the latter being exceptionally good. Now a very large portion of the game consists of these possessions, where you need to swap hosts or possess items to solve puzzles and further advance. But let's get the bad out of the way before we delve deeper. The standard enemy AI is quite mediocre. However, the possession mechanic is so good, and some of the boss fights are incredible, which more than makes up for this shortcoming. As far as the bosses themselves are concerned, they're pretty decent for most of the game, but the last few being absolutely outstanding. Now admittedly, Geist is a little rough in areas, but those minor aspects are more than made up for with its originality in its story and gameplay. I would love to say if it was worked on for perhaps another couple of months, it would have been much better. On a more positive note, there is a decent amount of replayability with the game. There's a multiplayer mode, where you can go up to against 7 bots, and while the AI isn't perfect like I mentioned, you could always ask a friend to join in. Overall, Geist is a solid game. It just suffers from some big flaws that keep it from being a great game. Evolution World centers around the character of Mag Launcher, part of a rather famous family who have fallen on hard times. The story begins with you heading out in the hopes of restoring your family's name, but as you would expect, it soon deepens and opens up into a larger tale that quite sadly just doesn't really go anywhere. Unlike most RPGs, there isn't a giant evil about to destroy the world that only you can stop. Instead, you're sent on special jobs to different dungeons by a group known as the Society to hunt for artifacts of a long vanished ancient civilization in the various dungeons that make up the adventure. On the gameplay front, one nice thing is that there are no random battles. You can see the enemies doing their thing in the distance and at times can either surprise them or even avoid them completely. The battles themselves use a turn-based system and to spruce things up, there's a 3x3 grid that your party can move around on during each encounter. Those in the front row will incur the most amount of damage but will also inflict the most on the enemies. Naturally, if you're on the back row, you'll take less damage, but if you happen to be using ranged type weapons, you can still cause some serious pain. This inclusion of formations, while not new in the RPG world, did add a little more strategy to the battles. If you're a big fan of roguelike RPGs, Evolution World is a great game, but it's just not exactly the best dungeon crawler around. The characters are cute and fun, the game is bright and cheerful, but it's also extremely repetitive gameplay wise. Maybe it would have been better if you could explore outside the dungeons, visit more towns, or just interact a bit more with the environment. It is great for people who've never played the original games, but if you have, there's not much new on offer that the Dreamcast versions had already cooked up. If Nintendo is well known for one thing, it has to be their wealth of mascots. But not all of them share the same pedigree as, say, Mario or Princess Peach. Enter Chibi Robo, a small lovable robot who's been given to a little girl named Jenny. Your task is simple, make the family happy. Their happiness is expressed in happy points, which essentially stand in as a sort of leveling up system for Chibi, which you'll earn for doing beneficial tasks. At first, you'll simply go around picking up garbage and wiping up stains. Eventually, however, there's some major major character interaction moments that allow the player the opportunity to pick up a ton of these points. Now when you take a step back, I suppose that stripped down as far as it could go, Chibi Robo is basically a sandbox game, but with the twist that rather than exploring a prep school or a huge city, you're confined to a fairly standard suburban home, complete with your typical areas such as a living room, a kitchen, a large foyer, bedrooms and a backyard. Scattered throughout these areas are a ton of quests, items and characters, and it's the way that that these things interact together with a surprisingly strong story that makes Chibi Robo such a success. By doing chores like mopping, washing windows and walls with things found around the house like toothbrushes, you'll earn a currency known as Moolah. Moolah can be used to buy much needed items like an extension to add more time to the day and night cycle or an extra battery to let Chibi live that little bit longer. You can decide who around the house you want to help and when, which provides some non-linear relief to the main story of the game. Now, help 
dropping a bunch of toys and doing chores for a dysfunctional family may sound ridiculous, but it is the main charm of the game. Though not for everyone, GB Robo was definitely a breath of fresh air. Whatever the case, if you like your games a bit different from the norm, you definitely need to pick this one up. The premise behind Billy Hatcher and the giant egg is a strange one indeed. A boy named Billy Hatcher must save the world of chickens by donning a magical chicken suit and using its powers to manipulate eggs, which bear many colourful designs. You can use them as weapons, transportation, and even hatch them to release friends. This leads to some very unique gameplay, as Billy is completely defenceless without an egg, as you can't harm enemies even by jumping on them. Instead, you roll and steer the egg into the enemies to defeat them, but the real use comes from the incredible incredible mobility they give the hero. You can bounce on the ground like a sprint, dash forward and make long jumps, or even propel yourself forward at high speeds in mid-air. The world itself is designed to revolve around these gameplay elements, not to mention the physics of carrying a large egg in the first place. You'll find yourself coming across a diverse set of locations, with about 7 worlds in total that are comprised of 8 missions each. What makes it interesting is that you'll receive several objectives to fulfil that deviate from the standard just finished level. Level. You'll be asked to take out specific numbers of enemies, as well as rescue chickens that help to spice up the gameplay and keep it fresh. The play mechanics and running around with your eggs and having fun with the physics all help to make Billy Hatcher and the giant egg a real joy to play. However, problems do arise with the camera occasionally getting stuck behind objects, and the most prevalent time that this issue seems to rear its ugly head is during the many boss fights. Most of these encounters see the boss moving around the area at high speeds, with your best bet being to simply just lock onto them. This works most of the time, but for some bosses it can be difficult to tell what the hell is going on, leading to some rather frustrating moments. If you never got round to it when it first released all those years ago, I would recommend picking it up. Sure it wasn't Sonic Team's finest hour, but it does provide hours of challenging gameplay as well as a distinct amount of replay value that will keep you playing it for quite some time. Directed by Suda51, a self-proclaimed madman in love with the idea of games becoming art, Killer7 was the final entry in a series of games known as Capcom 5. With three of the five having already been released and one indefinitely cancelled, Killer7 marked the end of the deal. Now trying to make sense of Killer7's narrative is a bit of a tall order, but the general premise sees you taken up the part of Harmon Smith, a man with seven different personalities that you control. Each one of your personalities is an assassin assassin with a unique ability, such as becoming invisible while having super speed, and as you would guess, this plays heavily into gameplay. Now what might have the potential to turn some players off is the fact that Killer7 is largely on rails, and only allows the player to direct their character as well as tackle several shooting sections which play the largest role. At the centre of the entire experience though is a simple mechanic that sees you collecting the blood of your fallen enemies, in order to use it to level up and upgrade your character's abilities. There's plenty to unlock as well as new costumes and weapons which makes collecting as much blood as you can, one of the primary driving forces behind the game. But one of the most resounding aspects of Killer7 is its unique visual style. The developers use the cell shading technique to great effect. You won't find realistically detailed environments on offer, instead you'll be treated to canvases of colour that ooze with grace. Ranging from moody corridors to vibrant city streets, Killer7 offers a hefty variety of areas to play in. As it wears on though, there comes a point where some of the novelty of the aesthetic wears off, and the combat does begin to feel a bit repetitive, and it's at this point that the player's interest in the story will become the main motivating factor going forward. Killer7 is a game very different from the rest, you're either gonna love it or hate it. There isn't honestly any room in between, you'll spend a lot of time merely watching, and it could be argued you're not really playing a game at all, but more of an interactive novel. But this is an experience like no other. As part of a deal with Capcom known as Capcom 5, the company was to develop five unique titles including Resident Evil 4 exclusively for the then new Nintendo console. One game that flew under the radar though was Piano 3. It was a third person shooter that saw you taken on the part of a rather nimble lady known as Vanessa, with the emphasis of the gameplay focusing more on high scores and combos rather than just taking enemies out. The abilities afforded to Vanessa thanks to her slinky suit sees her being able to shoot projectiles 
projectiles from the palm of her hands, as well as acrobatically jump and swerve with style. Using these techniques, you must master avoiding enemy fire and destroying machines as you infiltrate new areas. It's all rather arcadey, which means that a lot of what you do is quite repetitive. If you need any motivation for gaining the highest amount of points on offer, there is also an upgrade element to the game. Your high score points can be used to upgrade your equipment, buy new, more advanced suits or extra continues if you prefer. These upgrades almost become necessary for the higher difficulties. However, there is also a one hit a new die suit for the true hardcore out there. And while mastering this game is not an easy task, it is a fun process. Visually, Piano 3 is hands down one of the best looking games on the system. Sure, the somewhat drab and clinical style may not be to everyone's tastes, but for me, I absolutely love the sci-fi aesthetic, as well as the impressive animation of Vanessa herself, for obvious reasons. Piano 3 is expertly polished in every aspect. If you've been getting that craving lately to bust out an older console to experience a few retro titles, I recommend grabbing the GameCube and giving Capcom's gem a try. Just be sure to leave all of your preconceived ideas of how a modern first-person shooter should play at the door, and you'll find that it's a more than worthy addition to your library. For those of you that absolutely need a deep, involved story in your games, this will not be the one for you. Gotcha Force sports one of the most cliché coming-of-age stories you'll ever see, with the player taken on the fight as Cap, a young boy who has predictably just moved to town. On a class field trip, he stumbles across G-Red, a toy-sized gotcha robot with incredible fighting abilities. The experience springs to life once in play, and sees you having command of a series of robots which can all be collected throughout the course of the game. Naturally, they all all have their own distinct characteristics such as unique weapons and capabilities which help each of them stand out from the last. They have lasers, swords, cannons, tractor beams, drills, flamethrowers and just about anything else that the game designers could come up with. And you're gonna need them because you'll be facing dozens of enemies throughout each battle. However, chances are that you'll never get the opportunity. The AI and gotcha force can be pretty tough in later battles, especially if you don't spend some time making up your force beforehand, you may get annihilated in seconds. Unfortunately, that's not the only thing you have to contend with, as the camera could be classed as an enemy itself. Instead of incorporating an overhead view or a first-person perspective, the camera is fixed on your gotcha robot throughout the fight. That means if you perform a quick dash attack, the camera angle will go wild and suddenly move, leaving you rather disorientated. Despite a few flaws, Gotcha Force is still a solid action fighting game. For all of those who enjoy mechs, excellent multiplayer, and collecting objects, Objects, you'll feel right at home. And even though you won't get much story out of Cow's robotic misadventures, you can rest assured that your gaming experience will be full of fun and intense battles. Career in Squash is one of those odd games that really can't be fully understood until you actually play it. The basic concept all revolves around a rotating stick that the player must navigate through an ever increasingly difficult labyrinth. It may sound simplistic at first, but in reality, the Career in series is all about making even the most frustratingly tangled levels a whole lot of fun to play. But simply, the controls for this game just make sense. The analog stick moves your ship through the levels, the R button speeds up its rotation, while the B button pushes your ship through the level that bit faster. In instances where you have a special ability attached to your ship, the A button activates it. The controls really couldn't be any easier to understand, and this is what helps the game excel. To add a bit of deviation to the gameplay, every couple of levels you'll be treated to a special variation. In some levels, you'll have punching gloves on your vehicle to attack enemies. In others, you'll get to pilot a submarine, meaning you'll have to worry about two levels at once, above water and underwater. Career in Squash has a fair amount of replay value as well. Admittedly, it is a short game if you just blast through all the levels and leave it at that, but this game is about getting higher scores, collecting all of the coins in each level, completing the levels without hitting any walls at all, will all take a decent amount of time and will earn you in-game rewards. There are extra ships and screen layouts that can be purchased with the coins that you collect. Of course, if you have friends to play this game with, that will also extend the game's replay value with a wide range of specially designed levels for racing through with friends. If you've ever played the old Karurin games on the Game Boy Advance, you'll feel right at home, and with the simplicity of the gameplay, it's also perfect for newcomers alike. 
Beta and Kytos is a card-based RPG and was the first game in the series that would go on to spawn a few spin-offs on the GameCube and DS. It takes place in a world that consists of islands floating above a ravaged earth, each independently ruling itself. There's five in total, each with unique cultures that results in the feeling of a believable space when you visit each one. Now when it comes to gameplay, as I mentioned, cards play a significant role. Basically, each character has a deck of cards which are used for either attacking, defense, healing, and many other actions. You can string these cards together as well to make longer and more powerful combos. Each of the cards have a number, and if you string these numbers, like 1, 2, 3, and so on, you'll make your attack stronger. Known as Magnus in the game world, there's a ton of cards to be collected during the adventure. At times, you'll also be required to have certain Magnus cards to proceed. Because of this, locating as many cards as you can soon becomes the order of the day, which opens up many options for the player to explore. When it comes to present Presentation, Beta and Kytos features pre-rendered graphics which are beautifully presented, vibrant and full of life. While many games that adopt this approach tend to be a bit static, the graphics are full of little animations which make them even more lively. May it be the subtle background animations in a town or the more impressive battles that light up the screen. Almost every area in this game is such a work of beauty, both in terms of the art itself and the effect of seeing it in motion. It won't be for every player out there, but for those those that click with it, the game easily becomes one of the best RPGs on the GameCube. Despite the GameCube's child-friendly image, there were many games that hoped to cater to the more mature audience the console had managed to acquire. One that unfortunately never made that much of an impact was Eternal Darkness. It initially sees you taken up the role of a college student, Alex, who learns of her grandfather's brutal murder at his old mansion. After searching this huge property, she finds a room with a large leather-bound book known as the Tome of Eternal Darkness, and here is where the adventure begins. The story is divided into 12 segments, which sees you playing as several characters throughout history. For each chapter completed, Alex gains new knowledge of this strange phenomenon, and the truth behind her grandfather's death becomes closer to entering her grasp. When it comes to gameplay, it all revolves around something known as the sanity meter. Every single time you encounter an enemy, the bar will deplete, and then certain effects will start happening on the screen. Blood will start dripping from walls, fake flies will obscure your view, the screen will start tilting to the sides, and even simulate the TV turning off. It might might sound strange, but I remember the first time I saw the volume prank, I actually thought I'd sat on my remote control or something. When you're playing it alone at night, this kind of stuff can really get under your skin. Now the game will probably last around 15 hours, though that's not including all of the game overs you'll likely get. You're encouraged to replay it twice more after your first time, because there are three different approaches you can take with the game. What's cool about subsequent replays is that there will be little changes in the levels, as well as completely new endings for the player to achieve. Overall, Eternal Darkness is eerie, atmospheric and complex, so if you've got an itch for that kind of thing, it would make a solid addition to your collection. Well that does it for today's video, keep an eye out for part 2 as that will be coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos. You can follow me on all of the socials to stay up to date and also join our growing community on Discord to meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd also like to give a special shout out to our Patreon supporters, Rhino, Skill Jim, Nano, Steve, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Paul, Quinn, Dio, Alex, Simon, and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, you'll find all of these links in the description. As always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video. I'll catch you next time.